Okay, well, good evening. It is time for us to begin tonight, and uh, we're going to start 2 Corinthians, and uh, I've asked several people to uh, uh, read, and what we're going to do is just tonight spend our time reading 2 Corinthians. Uh, if the bell rings and we're not quite done, we'll just we'll go ahead and stop for the night, uh, and then we'll pick up there next week, but I think we'll be able to get through it. I was looking at uh, the first three chapters today. Uh, I have a little app that will read it to me, and it took seven and a half minutes for the first three chapters. So I think, well, we, we should be able to get through. Um, so last semester, in the spring semester, I took a, a class called New Testament World uh, with Dr. Kevin Moore. And uh, Dr. Moore was talking about how, uh, you know, they were, uh, the first century was really an oral culture meaning that they heard everything. Most, most people didn't read. Uh, writing material was expensive. Uh, in another class, we went through what it would have cost Paul to write the letters, and, you know, like the short letters in today's dollars would have been about $1,200 uh, in material, ink and, and paper and everything like that. So uh, people didn't take notes when they went into, you know, worship services. They didn't. You know, if there was a public announcement at the square, you just had to go in and memorize. And I thought that was a fascinating take on, you know, how these, you know, these letters and these books were written in a way uh, primarily to be heard. Uh, then a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was last week, the beginning of last week, I came across a, a video of a guy lecturing on the same thing. His name was David Rhodes. And... Uh, he was basically saying the same thing that you know these were these were not literate people they were oral people they were used to hearing things and so uh, one thing that Dr. Rhodes does is he uh, presents uh, he has a two hour presentation of Mark where he basically quotes Mark the entire book which I, I only listened to he did a fifteen minutes of it there in that lecture and I don't know, there's something different about it uh, to the point where when he was, it, almost immediately when he started, uh, I, I found myself just weeping. It, it, it was that, to me, it was that emotional. Uh, you know, what would it have been like to have been those in the first century to hear these words for the first time and the blessings that they're bringing, the, the, the promise of freedom from the bondage of sin and and, and so that was, that was interesting to me. And so uh, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to just read the book all the way through one night. And I realize I'm taking away y'all's time. <laughs> but uh, that I, wa I want to explain why I think this is an important exercise. But here's another thing I would ask. And you don't have to do this. But don't read along with your Bible. Just listen to the words. As, as if you were in the first century, because you wouldn't have had anything to read, read along with then. So just, just listen to the words as we begin. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints who are in the, in the whole of Achaia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort. And salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of even life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, 
But this was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that we will deliver, he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted to us through the prayers of many. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behave in the world with simplicity and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. For we are not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand and hope that you will fully understand, just as you did in partially understand us, that on the day of our Lord Jesus, you will boast of us and we will boast of you. Because I was sure of this, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. I was vacillating when I wanted to do this, or was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no, at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word uh, to you has not been yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrain from coming again to Corinth, not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy and for, for, you, for you stand firm in your faith. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have caused pain? And I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of you, or felt sure of all of you, that my joy would be uh, the, that my joy would be the joy of all of you. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too start severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the, by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your, your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open to me or for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, like so many, peddlers of God's word, but as men of sin sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Amen. 
chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letters of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all, and you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the minister of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all, because the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put on a, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze on the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by open statement of truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone conscious in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds of the unbelievers, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as the servants of Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body of the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So the death is at work in us, but life in you. Since, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that the grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Through our outer self, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentarily affliction is preparing us for the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. 
For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would further clothe, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due and what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are known, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not condemning ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all. And those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, and for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old passed away, behold, and the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I'll be beginning with chapter 6. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in this time of my favor, I hear you, and in the days of salvation, I help you. I tell you, now it is time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path, so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in trouble, hardships, and distress, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleeplessness, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, no yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and opened wide our hearts to you. We are not withholding our affection from you, but you are holding yours from us. As a fair exchange, I speak as my children, open wide your heart also. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Biel? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, 
says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and my daughters, uh, says uh, the Lord Almighty. Okay. What happened to foot <laughs> number seven? That was the end of chapter six. Okay. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, uh, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one and have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I have said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die for you. I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. For when we came to Macedonia, we had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn. Conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort uh, you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. Even I caught even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorrow, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God indeed, and so were, were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorry, sorrow brings death. See what godly sorrow has produced in you? What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indiga indiga indignation, uh, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point, you prove yourself to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote to you, it was neither on account of the one who did the wrong nor on account of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are. By all this, we are encouraged. In addition, in addition to our encouragement, we were especially decided, delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit had been refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you, and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling. I am glad I have completed a complete confidence in you. Chapter 8. <clears throat> now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had previously made a beginning, so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness, 
and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious, gracious work also. I am not speaking this as a command, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. I give you my opinion in this matter, for this is to your advantage, who were the first to begin a year ago not only to do this, but also to desire to do it. But now finish doing it also, so that just as there was the readiness to desire it, so there may also be the completion of it by your ability. For if the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For this is not for the, for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply of their need, so that their abundance may also become a supply for your need, that there may be equality. equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted your, our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he has gone to you of his own accord. We have sent along with him the brother whose fame in the things of the gospel has spread through all the churches. And not only this, but he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work, which is being administered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness. readiness. Taking precaution that, so that no one will discredit us in our administration of this generous gift, for we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. We have sent with, with them our brother, whom we have often tested and found diligent in many things, but now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the church, churches a glory to Christ. Therefore, openly, before the churches show them the proof of your love and our reason for boasting about you. For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints. For I know your readiness of which I boast about you to, I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I have sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case so that, as I was saying, you may be prepared. Otherwise, if, Ma if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. While they also, by prayer on your behalf, yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Now I, Paul, myself, urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with confidence, with the confidence which, with which I propose to be courageous against some who regarded us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for their destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ's, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for, the, for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame. For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. For they say, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpress unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in words, in word by letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, but when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach to you. For we were the first to come even as far as you in the gospel of Christ, not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another but he who boasts is to boast in the lord for it is not he who commands himself that is approved but he whom the lord commands Chapter 11, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am af afraid that, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you bear this beautifully. For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. But even if I am unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way, we have made this evident to you in all things. Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted, because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge? I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone, for when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I may cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded, just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder... For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. Again, I say, let no one think me foolish. But if you do, receive me even as foolish, so that I also may boast a little. 
What I am saying, I am not saying as the Lord would, but as in foolishness in this confidence of boasting. Since many boast according to the flesh, I will boast also. For you, being so wise, tolerate the foolish gladly. For you tolerate it if anyone enslaves you, anyone devours you, anyone takes advantage of you, anyone exalts himself, anyone hits you in the face. To my shame, I must say that we have been weak by comparison. But in whatever respect anyone else is bold, I speak in foolishness. I am just as bold myself. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane, I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews thirty-nine lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such eternal, excuse me, apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the Ethanarch under Artemis, the king, was guarding the city of the Damascenes in order to seize me. And I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and so escaped his hands. Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. On behalf of such a man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. For I do not, for I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish. For if I do wish to boast, I will not be foolish. For I will be speaking the truth, but I refrain from this, so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was, a, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I have, I have become foolish. You yourselves have compelled me. Actually, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am a nobody. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance, by signs and wonders and miracles. For in what respect were you treated as inferior to the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not become a burden to you, Forgive me this wrong. Here for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden for you. For I do not seek what is yours but you, for children are not responsible to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be expended for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? But be that as it may, I, do, I did not burden you myself. Nevertheless, crafty fellow that I am, I took you in by deceit. Certainly I have not taken advantage of you through any of those whom I have sent to you, have I? I urged Titus to go, and I sent the brother with him. Titus did not take advantage of you, did he? Did we not conduct ourselves in the same spirit and walk in the same steps? All this time you have been thinking that we are defending ourselves to you. Actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ, and all for your upbuilding, beloved. For I am afraid that perhaps when I come I may find you to be not what I wish and may, and may be found by you to be not what you wish, 
there, that perhaps there will be strife, jealousy, anger, tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. I am afraid that when I come again, my God may humiliate me before you, and I may mourn over those who have not sinned in the past and have be repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they have practiced. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have previously said when present the second time, and though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to all the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone, since you are seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me and who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For, for indeed, he was crucified because of weakness, yet he lives because of the, of the power of God. For we are also weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed toward you. Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. Now we pray to God that you do no wrong, not that we ourselves may appear approved, but that you may do what is right, even though we appear unapproved. For we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we ourselves are weak, but you are strong. This we also pray for, that you may be, may be complete. For this reason, I am writing these things while absent, so that when present, I need not use in severity in accordance with the authority which the Lord gave me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. feeling of maybe those first century Christians hearing for the first time these letters and uh, think about the difference in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians uh, and one of the things that uh, you notice in 2 Corinthians is uh, Paul gets a little more personal with the attacks against himself you know I'm, you know, the, the letters of commendation the, the thorn in the flesh the perils that he faced and so it appears that uh, from 1 Corinthians now into this 2 Corinthians, and we'll, as we introduce this next week, we'll talk about how many letters were there, uh, how many visits were there, and how intimate they are. Julie and I were talking yesterday, I think it was yesterday, it might have been the day before, about uh, Ephesians and Colossians, uh, you know, two very similar letters that are referred to as prison epistles, and yet uh, in Ephesians, here very impersonal. He doesn't mention names much. Like here, he mentions Silas and Timothy, and uh, he mentions uh, uh, he says himself and other people as well. Uh, and he just doesn't. You don't find that in Ephesians. You find a lot of it in Colossians. And what's really amazing is he spent three years in ministry at Ephesus, and he had never been to Colossae. And yet, it was a much more personal le letter, written about the same time as Ephesians seems a little less personal. So it's kind of interesting when you start uh, putting the chronology of when did Paul write these letters and what was happening. And, uh, it's one of the things you find in Acts is, uh, you know, there's from chapter, uh, you know, after Paul's conversion, and then at least from chapter 13 to the end of the book, Paul is the main focus of the book of Acts. Do you know what Acts is not mentioned at all? ever writing a letter. And yet when we think of Paul, what do we think of? His letters. Now we might think of a few of his speeches in the book of Acts, but most of what we study and know about Paul is from his letters, which is a major part of his ministry. And yet the book of Acts is completely silent on him. Think, things to think about. I, I think those are interesting. I, I really look forward to, to getting in next week to uh, uh, the introduction, at least, and maybe even chapter one of, of Second Corinthians. Uh, I mentioned to some of those earlier, but I do want to mention uh, 